And you know, when Josh first started talking about this series where we could find rest for our souls, I thought that is so needed, right? And every person that I kind of pitched the series to, like, what do you think if we do this summer series on finding rest for our souls? Every person was like, we need that. And I love that Josh was so sensitive to what the Lord was doing, but I'm also like, I hate that we need this series. Because if we're longing for rest for our souls, that means that they are not at rest most of the time. When we read our anchor verse, Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Typically, we land on the side of weary and heavy burdened rather than on the side of rest. Would you agree, or is it just me? Okay, so I was in youth ministry for like 10 years, and when I ask a question, I expect you to answer. Thank you. I also have three kids, five and under. Their response is, yes, mama, don't say that, that'd be weird. But if I were to take a poll right now and you were to be really honest, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to be honest because I think it does no good for us if we show up in church and pretend like our lives rock and we're suffering alone and then everybody else thinks that if their life is rough, then they're in the minority and they don't belong here. So we're just going to all have a moment of honesty. And if I'm, I'm going to ask you, do you relate more to, on a more frequent basis, the weary and heavy burden or the at rest? If you're the weary and heavy burden, raise your hand. Oh, that's what I thought. If you have found rest all the time for your soul, yeah, I can't even pretend, <laughs> right? So we're in this place of we can't say that sermon wasn't for me, church isn't for me, if we're all acknowledging that we're in this place of weary and heavy burden, but rather let's journey together to the foot of the cross where Jesus promises rest for our souls. Because this is my favorite thing about what we're going to talk about through this whole series is that if it wasn't possible for our souls to be at rest, Jesus would not have promised it. Like somebody tweet that, or threads or Instagram, none of you know what I'm talking about. That's the young people thing. Okay, here's the deal. That's a wow moment. If Jesus, if he, if rest for our souls wasn't possible, he never would have said, come to me and get it. He would have said, good luck. <laughs> Like, you can try as hard as you want, but you'll never get there. That's not the gospel. Well, it is the gospel because we can try as hard as we want to get someplace, and that ain't going to happen, right? Without Jesus, we are hopeless. But Jesus says three words. Come to me. How beautiful is that? How beautiful that everyone who is feeling weary and heavy burdened, which is 99.9% .9 of us and the other percent of you were lying, all we have to do is come to Jesus. I was joking with Seth, our sound tech, before this. I said, you know, I could just stand up there and say, we're going to sing these songs again, listen to the lyrics at the end, and walk off. And he's like, I dare you. I said, I want to keep my job. <laughs> but what we just sang about the glory of God being beautiful. There's another in the fire. Some of you saying this line, are you ready for it? I'll count the joy come every battle. Y'all just saying that. I'll count the joy come every battle. How many of you are like, battlefield, let's go! I can't wait for my family to be facing persecution. I can't wait for somebody in my family to get diagnosed with a disease. I can't wait to get the phone call that no parent ever wants to get. No! And if you do, let's talk after. None of us on our own are like, I can't wait for the battle. But when we know with whom we are fighting, when we know who is fighting for us, when we know that we find Jesus in the battle, we count the joy because we know that's where he'll be. And so I want to look at a passage of scripture this morning, a story that you may be familiar with from um, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, it's going to be up on the screen behind me. But the problem with stories in the Gospels is that when people first begin doing Bible study and a pastor or a mentor tells them where to start, they typically say, start in the Gospels which means this is one of the stories that you've probably heard a number of times. 
And you know when you hear something over and over again, it kind of becomes white noise. And so I want to challenge you and ask you and encourage you this morning to not let this be a story that you've heard a bunch of times, to not think of who the person in the room is that needs to hear this or the person who's not in the room who needs to hear this, but allow the word of God to speak to your heart this morning. My prayer has been that even though I'm the one with the microphone, that the Lord wouldn't not speak to me. But even as I'm up here sharing the word of God with you, that he would be speaking to my heart and transforming me as well. And so we're on this, this journey together. Starting in verse 11. As Jesus continued toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten lepers stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. How cool is that? If you don't know what leprosy is, it's a skin-eating disease. It's contagious and it's nasty. I mean, I don't know what part of skin-eating disease wouldn't be nasty, so that was a little bit redundant. A flesh-eating disease where when you contracted this illness, you were cast out of the city into a leprous colony. You would find community because we agree we're created for community. We don't do well living alone. But the problem is with this community, it was really a matter of waiting for the next person to go. How hopeless is that? I mean, not to make a joke of it, but that's kind of what 2020 was. You found your bubble of people, and you stayed together, and you just wondered who was going to get it next. Taking tests, being nervous, and then, and then at the beginning of COVID when you got it, you might as well have had leprosy. Now, understandably, we had to take safety measures and precautions, and that's exactly what this community was doing. When someone contracted leprosy, this incredibly infectious, dangerous disease, they would put them in quarantine until they got better. They'd quarantine them in a community. But the problem is they didn't get better. There was no medical cure. There was no research being done. There was no medications that could help leprosy. Once you contracted the disease, it was game over. And so I find it fascinating that 10 lepers were traveling together, or rather they were camping out because they knew Jesus was traveling, which is always fascinating how people know when people were traveling back there because there was no Life360 or like maps or Snapchat maps. I think that's a thing. I don't know. There was no news alert saying Jesus is going to be entering the city of Jerusalem at Two o'clock on Thursday. Please keep Main Street clear and park in the over. Like, no. So these men were camping out. Maybe they were women, men and women. They were camping out, waiting for Jesus. And what I think is so interesting is it says in verse 12, as he entered the village there, ten lepers stood at a distance. They didn't dare go near Jesus but they understood his power. Maybe they had witnessed a miracle. Maybe they had seen a friend not come back to the colony and they thought, oh, another one bites the dust, but then they saw him in town and they're like, wait a second, what? How? And news traveled so fast, even without social media, that Jesus was performing miracles. That he was the real deal. And so these lepers stood at a distance, not daring to go near Jesus because they were broken, they were disgusting, they were hurting, they were isolated, they didn't dare go near him. And so they stood at a distance shouting, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus knew that they were asking to be healed, to be restored, to be cleansed. And so he said to them, go. As was custom when somebody thought that they were welcome to re-enter society, they would go to the temple and the priest would check them over and make sure that they were good and they would get the pass to go back into the city. And so these men had a measure of faith and women. See, I always do this. I'm a, I'm a girl and I always assume it's guys. I don't know. These lepers, they began to go toward the city 
And I just wonder if there was some dissension between them, like, this is dumb, why are we doing this? Like, nothing happened. I'm still, I, I still don't have a pinky. Like, how is that going to happen? But as they made their way, their limbs started to regrow, their skin started to heal. It was like they just had a full-on facial, and they just looked absolutely perfect. What? Can you imagine? If you've ever broken a bone, had a cast, had a surgery, had to recover, I'm sure there's a whole list of things that you think of that you can't wait to do once you're recovered. I had way too many knee surgeries, and I just couldn't wait to not wear a brace. <laughs> I couldn't wait to go to trampoline park with my friends. I couldn't wait to walk on the beach without being in excruciating pain. There was a list of things that I just couldn't wait to do once I was healed, and I imagine that these lepers felt the same way. They had these dreams that they never thought would be imaginable. They never thought it would be possible for them to pursue these desires, these dreams, to be with their families. Perhaps they had been separated from a spouse, from their children, from their community. They had almost even lost hope that they would ever get the chance to be reunited, yet here Jesus is. And from a distance, he tells them to go. And they're cleansed. But the story isn't over. It rarely is with Jesus, right? One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. And if you, if you know a little bit about Samaritans and Jews, which Jesus was a Jew, this man was a Samaritan, it was like a massive East Sanford rival. Like, they were not friends. And so this guy who first of all, had leprosy, second of all, had been an outcast, and third of all, was from the wrong town. When he saw he was healed, he didn't care. All he could do was praise God, run to him, fall on his knees before him, and thank him. And you know what I think happens so often with us? Is we shout out from a distance, Jesus, have mercy on us. And then, if things go the way we want them to, we celebrate with our friends and family, we post on Facebook, we text our friends, God is good, and we go our merry way. But you know what? Those guys, they, they were healed physically. I'm sure that was great. But as we read on, we see Jesus' response. He asked, didn't I heal ten men? Like, where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. You know what we don't read in the next verse? We don't read, and the other nine men contracted leprosy again. Like, Jesus didn't punish them for not returning to him. They were healed physically. But I did a little bit of digging. Because I feel like there's always something more that Jesus wants us to learn from this. And so in verse 14, they were cleansed of their leprosy. That original word, cleansed, in the original text, is a physical healing. They were healed. That's exactly what they were. But when you go down to verse 19, where Jesus says, your faith has healed you, it's a different root word. It means saved. Your faith has saved you. And if you've heard anything about Jesus or the Bible before, you've heard that in Jesus there is salvation. In Jesus there is life. In Jesus there is healing, but healing not just for external situations, but healing and peace and rest for our soul. And when did this man receive that? When he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus. 
he found healing that went beyond a physical ailment. And some of you might be saying, well, of course he went and thanked Jesus. He was healed. I celebrate and I praise God and I go to church the week after something good happens in my family too. But what if Jesus hadn't healed them? What if their situation didn't change? What if they were in the middle of heartache and hardship? How are they supposed to go to the feet of Jesus then? Well, one of the most common psalms in scripture addresses that. Psalm 23, you ever heard it? First time I had the chance to stand on this stage and speak the word of God over a room full of people was when I was six years old at my grandfather's funeral. When I stood up here with my little lisp, and I told people, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I recited the 23rd Psalm. And when I got to verse 5, I didn't think of it then. But I realize now that this is why Psalm 23 is so frequently used at funerals. Because Psalm 23, verse 5 says, He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Psalm 23 does not read, he prepares a table before me and kicks out all the bad guys. It doesn't say, Jesus prepared a table for me once I figured out all of my crap. It doesn't say he prepares a table before me and I don't have to worry about anything ever because it's fine, everything's fine, nothing's bad, nothing bad is ever going to happen because I'm just going to go have dinner with Jesus and it's going to be great. No, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. If anyone knew about the presence of their enemies, it was David, the one who penned this psalm. Because whether he was tending flocks in a field, looking out for bears and wolves and lions and tigers, oh my, just making sure you're still awake. Or he was looking up at a giant, the story that we all love to talk about. Or he was running for his life from King Saul who wanted to kill him. Said he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Jesus, amidst the chaos, the struggle, and the nine foot giants that we're looking up at our lives, he says, Come to the table. Come to me. Did you know that scientifically it has been proven that you have about 9,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day? If someone's ever called you a space cadet, you're probably more on the 9,000 mark. I'm just kidding. 9,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day. And I wonder what it would look like if every single one of those thoughts was recorded like words are recorded in a court of law. What would be the theme? Would the theme be Anxiety, worry, fear, doubt, depression, loneliness, despair? Or would the theme be praise, worship, gratitude, joy, life? Jesus doesn't give us any crazy instructions on how to find rest for our souls. He says, come to me. And how do we do that? We come to him. And this guy, this leper, he came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. I think sometimes something happens or we get a glimpse of who Jesus is and we just silently think to ourselves, oh, praise God. And that's great. We should think that. That would be wonderful. But that's not what we see in Scripture. That's not what we see when 
Mary finds out she's pregnant and she runs to Elizabeth and they have a celebration of what God is doing. That's not what happens when Hannah finally gives birth to the son that she has praised God and prayed to God for. She brings him to the temple as an act of worship, giving her son back. That's not what we see when the woman who was at the well and Jesus told her everything she had ever done. It wasn't what she, she didn't walk away back to town timid and afraid. She ran back to the city telling everyone what Jesus had done. She didn't shirk back because she was embarrassed or afraid. She couldn't help but cry out the goodness of God. And I think we need to take a lesson from that this morning because the reality is we're so often quiet and reserved. And I'm not saying to be obnoxious and like offend people, but what I'm saying is do we live our lives in joyful celebration of the salvation we have received? Or do we instead focus on the problems that are temporary? When we wake up in the morning, do we say, oh, I don't want to get up. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to feed my children. This isn't a confession. <laughs> I don't want to drive through that traffic of downtown Sanford. I don't want to go back to the hospital and see my hurting relative. I don't want to have another conversation about this thing that's so difficult. I don't want to have to look at my spouse in the eyes and try to have a conversation because things are just so strained, I just don't know what to do. You know, we choose where our thoughts go. You can choose to wake up every morning in that same way and allow the enemies that surround the table to win. Or... You can remember the eternal gift of salvation that's promised to all who come to Jesus. And when we remember that, everything changes. I want to do a little exercise right now. Not like physical, I'm not into that type of person. Take 10, 15, 30 seconds. Pull out the notes app on your phone or write on your program or even just make a list in your head. What do you have to be grateful for? What has the Lord done in your life that gives you a reason to praise? What have you maybe never thanked God for? Yet in this moment, you're realizing that just like the leper, you have a reason to come and fall before the feet of Jesus, thanking him. Paul, the apostle, writes in a letter to the church in Thessalonica, give thanks in all circumstances. Now let me tell you, Paul knew every circumstance well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want, shackled in prison, shipwrecked, beaten, blind, hungry, tired, lonely. Yet he writes, in all things, give thanks. He says, I've learned the secret of being content. Another verse that we hear all the time. The secret of being content is the secret of knowing who God is, that you are his child, and that in all things he is worthy of our praise. And I, I think it's so funny. I've totally not said anything that was in my notes. That's why <laughs> there's been nothing on the screen. Sorry, guys. But sometimes we come to church and, and we end our service and we give you time to reflect and, and contemplate what the Lord is doing and 
sit in a space where tears flow. I had so many people come up to me and be like, would you stop making us cry? Like we've talked about suffering, we've talked about resilience. This series has been good, but it's been heavy. Well, yes, that's because what we're carrying is heavy. (laughs) But you know what I love about gratitude? It replaces grumbling. Praise replaces preoccupation. When we truly focus our praise on Jesus, it removes the thoughts and the distractions. And you know what you can't do when you are worshiping God? Worry. Worry and worship cannot coexist. And that's why Jesus invites us to the table in the presence of our enemies and says, sit down across from me. Come to me. Don't give the enemy a seat at the table. They might be surrounding us. The worries of this world, the stresses of this life, they might be surrounding us. You might be walking into a situation that is so incredibly difficult, I can't even begin to understand what it is. You might be looking at me saying, Shana, you gave me 10, 15 seconds to think of something that I'm thankful for, but I'm gonna need a whole lot longer. Great, because you know what? You have all day. Gratitude is considered a spiritual discipline. No one likes discipline. I don't, and if you're a marathon runner, kudos, but my guess is you don't run marathons because you love the training. I know someone who's going to school to be an orthopedic surgeon, and he's taking classes that he hates, but they're required to reach the goal. If you're trying to lose weight, or if you're trying to get in shape, or if you're trying to get your finances under control, or if you're trying to fill in the blank, it's not all fun. It's downright awful sometimes to get into the place where you can have the conversation, do the workout, invest the resources. It is difficult. It requires discipline. But the end goal the end result is so worth it. So you choose gratitude or grumbling. You choose worry or worship. You choose praise or preoccupation because it's scientifically proven that the thing that you focus on every day will continue to be the thing that you focus on every day. So do we choose to focus on the worry or instead do we remember the incredible gift of salvation that Jesus has offered to us, that he has given to us And just like the leper who was healed, do we run back to his feet, shouting, praise God.